Um, welcome to this public session of the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. Um, I'm Arnie Duncan, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Knight Commission, and Carol Carwright and I will be sharing the facilitation duties today. Um, before I introduce President Emmert, just a qu couple quick reminders. Uh, first, this session is being live streamed, so I ask Commission members and our panelists to please use the microphones when speaking. And we're pleased to have the media and others here to listen to this discussion. And following the conclusion of this session, there'll be an opportunity for media to interact with the panelists. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Emmert. Uh, he's been uh, running NCA for seven years. I've had the chance to work with him throughout those seven years. And I will say, whether it's publicly or privately, he's never been anything but honest and straight and sincere and passionate about making the NCA a better place for student athletes. And this is obviously a challenging time for you. It's also a time of real opportunity. And look forward to, again, another candid conversation. When you're done with your presentation, I'm sure panelists will have, uh, commission members will have some questions for you. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you very much. This, is, this structure is a bit like my, the last time I was in front of a group like this, it was my doctoral dissertation, I think, defense. So, <clears throat> so I, I'm, I'm hoping this is easier than that, uh, though I survived the other and uh, came out the other end. Well, uh, first of all, um, thank you for an, providing me an opportunity to come and talk with you. Uh, uh, everybody here knows and is committed to the importance of intercollegiate athletics as a integral part of American higher education, and so it's, it's a pleasure to get to, to see a lot of familiar faces and friends and, uh, and to get a chance to talk about what are undoubtedly some very, very serious challenges that college sports face right now. I thought, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Chairman, if I might, I'd just make a few brief remarks because I'd much rather engage in a conversation with you and, and see what's on your minds and we can learn some things from each other. Um, let, let me begin with, with the fairly obvious challenge that's been, con, been placed on all of our plates around um, men's basketball because of the revelations of the investigation by the Southern District of New York and, and the FBI. Uh, it, it, as, we, as we get through and sort through the sort of salacious headlines that have come out of that, which I think for everybody, I know everybody around this table, and I know from our recent board meetings uh, with the Board of Governors, uh, everybody in the NCAA governance model have been absolutely uh, uh, shattering in terms of the, the level of confidence that we have in some of the core um, assumptions around intercollegiate athletics. And, and as I've thought a lot about these issues, to me, they, they really aren't issues about just basketball or even just intercollegiate athletics for that matter, they really strike at two pretty fundamental notions and that's you know, what kind of enterprise are we in in higher education and how do we govern it? Uh, you know, the, the fact is, is that American higher education, this, this group knows, not the country as a whole probably, but this group understands that American higher education is, is unique in many, many ways. One of the most fundamental differences is that we engage in self-governance in American higher education. We don't have a national ministry of education. We have a secretary of education, obviously, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary. Uh, but it's quite different, as, as you would, I'm sure, uh, agree from a ministry of higher education or a ministry of sport or governmental entities that oversee higher education as they do in the rest of the world right down to decisions about curricular content and about qualifications of faculty and, and, and work that in the US we have from the very beginning turned over to self-regulation. Universities and colleges themselves hold themselves responsible for academic integrity. Universities and colleges themselves set up their own accrediting bodies and pass judgment on each other, whether it's the whole institution or whether it's your your uh, law school, or your medical school, or your chemistry department. All of those things are functions of a self-referential, self-policing process that requires that we stop and say, okay, how are we doing here? And that judgment is left to your peers. When the NCA was formed over 100 years now, 110 years ago now, more than that, I guess 112 years ago, uh, it was put together on that same fundamental principle that the universities and colleges of, as colleges of America themselves were the appropriate entities for governing and overseeing this 
anomalous thing called college sport. Anomalous because the rest of the world doesn't do this either, anything like we do. So we started this, this process of, of overseeing each other, of schools themselves ceding responsibility and authority to a collection of universities that they called the NCAA. And they decided that collectively we would all make decisions together. We'd all hold hands and we'd all agree on the fundamental principles. We'd all agree on what the rules of the games would be and the ways in which we'd govern them. And we interestingly also agreed that we would self-regulate and self-police ourselves. And that's worked remarkably well, especially when you consider all the other options for more than 110 or 115 years. Coincident with that fundamental assumption about governance and oversight is that we have to also reflect on what business are we in? Uh, you, you know, when you ask yourselves what business are we in in higher education, we're in the human development business. We're committed to developing young men and young women who come to our campuses to gain an education, to develop themselves physically and mentally, to acquire the capacity to go out after commencement and take on the world and do all the good things that we want and expect from all of our students. There, there has been, during that period of time, a lot of developments that have occurred that have called into question both of those fundamental principles. Uh, right now, we live in a time where American society is looking at all of our institutions, every one of them, across the board, and saying, are these people capable of self-regulation, whether it's Congress or business or medicine. The only, that when you look at public survey data again and again and again, right now the only entity that American people have significant confidence in is the military. So we have this, this point in time where people are saying, can you or can you not regulate the enterprises of your own activities? And it's not just in, in athletics, it's across the board in higher education. Indeed, when we just a couple of weeks ago surveyed the population, uh, we conduct surveys all the time around trying to get public opinion data to know what are people thinking about college sports, what are they thinking about higher education. We found that when, when our pollsters asked the American public about universities and the relationships to their student athletes, 79% of Americans, 79% of Americans said big universities put money ahead of their student athletes. Now, I can't think of anything right now 79% of Americans agree to, but they agreed to that. 69% when asked whether or not big schools and big school sport were part of the problem or the solution to the issues of college sports, 69% said those schools are part of the problem, not part of the solution. 51% said the NCAA was part of the problem, not part of the solution. You know, those are numbers that should cause us a lot of anxiety uh, because that tells us what people are thinking of right now, our ability to manage our own affairs, not just in college sport, but in higher education. When you go back then and you look at the core mission of higher education, this mission of developing human beings, of human development, and you see juxtaposed against it some individuals who see it simply as skill development, as developing one's basketball skills, so as to pursue a professional career with maybe a minor nod toward human development, but maybe even not that, you can see why people question what the enterprise is all about. If somebody is going to a campus for six months on their way to the NBA, it's hard for me to describe that as an effort in human development. I would pretty much describe that as an effort at skill development, becoming a slightly better basketball player so that I can increase my marketability in a marketplace. Now that's not to say that there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think that a young man or a young woman that wants to become a professional athlete, that's how they want to make a living, should have every opportunity to do that. Why, why not? I mean, what, what could be wrong with that? But that's fundamentally different than going to a university or a college to get a college degree and go through that human development process. Two distinctly different things. Only in America 
do we force someone to go to a university in order to pursue a professional sports career? Nobody else does that. Nobody, would even, nobody else would even think that was rational. But we're doing that in some part here, and it begs the question, why? Why would we do that? If you look at the problems right now in men's basketball, and you start with just Division I men's basketball, you've got about, in any given year, I don't know, 5,200 or so men's basketball players. Of those 5,200, I don't know, I could ask, I could ask uh, Len, I suppose. I don't know, Len, how many, uh, how many of the 60 in the NBA draft, or maybe David knows this, in the NBA draft, 60 people go, probably 40 of them come out of American colleges, handful of international players, something like that. So 40 or 50 or so people out of 5,200 play in the NBA. So we're talking about 1.5%. 1.5% who probably would just as soon have pursued some other avenue to the NBA as going to a university if it was available to them. We have every year a dozen or so, maybe 15 in a, in a big year, so-called one-and-dones. Why were they in college? It wasn't to, for human development. It was because they wanted to develop their skills. We need to sit back and pause and ask ourselves, what are some of the fundamental relationships that we have going on here that are causing these distortions that really disturb all of us? You know, I've been asked in the past couple of weeks a lot of times, well, what, where do you think this investigation is going? How many more schools will be caught up in this? Is this just the tip of the iceberg? The answer is I don't know anything about the investigation that you don't know, and the FBI and the Southern District in New York will likely keep it that way. That's, that's their business, not ours. Uh, but whether it's the tip of the iceberg or it's the whole iceberg doesn't really matter. It's disgusting enough as it is. And we got to recognize that we own that, that that's part of us that we're looking at. When, when we see a coach, an assistant coach making two, dollars $300,000 a year, taking a $10,000 bribe to throw some kid under the bus by steering him and his family to an irreputable financial advisor, you got to just be sick to your stomach. This kid has placed his entire trust in this individual, and for 10 grand, 20 grand, this guy just sold him down the river. When you see, allegedly, these are all allegations. I, I, I get that, and I have to say that up front. When you allegedly see a corporation spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to steer a kid toward, a, doesn't even care what school it is, as long as it's one of their companies, one of their school, schools, that ought to disturb us a lot. The, the sports marketing industry is some of the most creative people on God's earth. They are wonderful marketers. And you got to bribe a kid to get him to wear your shoes? I mean, something's wrong with that. And we have, to, we have to pause and say, what's that all about? Is this all about kids trying to get into a professional program? And how do we help them do that without them having to go through a charade? Is this about selling shoes? And, and we're not figuring out you know, how, to, how to help shoe companies do this without doing it dishonestly? We can figure out a better relationship there. We see, we see people bribing young men or their families to become uh, their advisee, you know, become, let them become their agent or their financial advisor. There's some very smart financial advisors sitting around this table, right? I, I don't think we have to have a system where that's got to go under the, under, be underhanded and under the table. How do we just move that up into the daylight? You know, if somebody needs and desires and has a legitimate interest in getting professional advice, how do we fix that? You know, we don't, we don't force people to get professional advice about their accounting career by, by taking a bribe from somebody. How do, we, how do we fix that relationship? How do we make that work better? All of those things are, are distortions of what the fundamental mission of higher education is all about. And, and we need to be paying very close attention to it. And then we need to make sure that we can demonstrate to the world that a lot of the audience that's sitting behind you there, that we in higher education are capable of self-governance. Because if we don't, somebody will. And, and I would encourage you all to think about who is it that would replace self-governance in higher education. 
when I hear that and think about it, I don't like the answers I come up with. They're not good answers at all in my book because I'm a higher education guy, and I like the way higher education in America functions. So what, what we've done, we being me and the Board of Governors of the NCA, in order to address the basketball issue is we've created a commission. And yeah, I know, you're a commission and they're a commission, and I know people don't want to hear about process and they don't want to hear about commissions, and I agree with them. I agree that this is not a time to sit around and talk any more than is necessary. We need to act and we need to demonstrate that we are in fact capable of resolving these, is these issues, that we, American higher education, have the, uh, the, the political will and fortitude to deal with some tough issues that leave things dramatically better than where they were when we started. But the only way to start is to have a really good conversation, an honest, frank conversation, and that's what this commission's all about. Uh, some of you have volunteered, I guess it would be a little too charitable, have agreed to serve on that commission, and I appreciate it enormously. But it's, it's very important to know that this commission is an independent body. It is intentionally made up of people who are not content experts. With all due respect to David and Bud and your son, uh, they're on that commission because they are people that are seen as people who understand the context of college basketball, not the content necessarily. That commission's gonna have to go out and talk to lots and lots of people. They're gonna have to gather information from all around the basketball world, in including and, and probably especially people who engage in that world in ways that we find disreputable. But we need to get information into that commission. Secretary Rice is being very careful in organizing it to be an independent body, to reach its own conclusions, to not be an extension of the NCAA, to be a, a, a body that's truly going to go where they think they need to go and bring back to, to the NCA and the Board of Directors and Governors some direct and specific recommendations that will not just be incremental nibbling around the edges, but will get at some of those fundamental relationships that I was just discussing. What should our relationship be with professional basketball? What should it be with shoe companies? What should it be with agents? What authority should we have to hold ourselves accountable in higher education so that we can avoid this kind of thing in the future? What do we do to make sure that we're providing students themselves with a sh fair shake so that they're comfortable and completely support the arrangements that we're engaged in? Those are the things that that, that commission is going to be looking at and I think it's going to be very important uh, that they maintain that, that independence and bring back to the board some very, very direct and very important uh, recommendations. I think also simultaneously with the, the uh, basketball scandal, we'll just call it that loosely, we also had findings come out around North Carolina. Now, we can all agree or disagree whether the the, the Committee on Infractions made the right choice or the wrong choice. That's, that's up to them. That's their job. It was, with all, I'm not pandering to the co-chair of the committee, but that panel included some extraordinary people uh, on it, uh, people whose opinions the NCA Board of Governors trust, and they're empowered to make those choices. It does, however, bear being pointed out that only a very small portion of Americans believe that that, that was the right decision that North Carolina was being held appropriately accountable for the behavior that occurred, that that too eroded confidence in higher education holding itself accountable. And therefore, we, not, this, not the commission, but we, higher education and the NCAA board, need to yet again say, all right, what do we want to hold each other accountable for? Is this something that we ought to be doing around academics more aggressively than we have in the past? Are the rules that exist, I know rules are boring and dull, but do the rules that, that exist today allow for that level of accountability or is that simply a function of accrediting agencies? In which case then somebody needs to sit down and talk with accrediting agencies and say here's what we want you to hold us accountable for. Because again, that too is a self-regulating, self-referential system like all of higher ed. And right now, people don't have confidence in it. So, you know, I, let me c conclude. That, and there's many, many issues we can talk about, I know, but these are the big ones of the day, of course. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to get hyperbolic. It's easy to, to exaggerate uh, these issues when they're laying right in front of us. 
But I've, and I, as Bud knows, we had our board meetings this last week out in the UCLA campus. Um, I, I told the board then, and I believe strongly today, that we, we cannot go to, to the next basketball season without seeing fundamental change in the way college basketball is, is operating. The public doesn't have sufficient confidence in any of us, uh, and I'll take that on myself too, in terms of our ability to resolve these issues. We simply have to demonstrate that we're willing to and that we can, and I am enormously confident that that's possible. So with that, Madam and Mr. Chairman, I'll pause for questions. Mr. Mark, let's open it up. Uh, Mark, I, I wonder if I could, uh, I think we'll focus on basketball in a minute. I wonder if you could think a little bit more about the, uh, or at least tell us a little bit more about what you uh, concluded from the North Carolina case, specifically whether the definition of academic conduct, which I was, or ap academic misconduct that I was part of the discussion on, ought to be re-examined um, to it seemed to me the committee, the infraction committee, was somewhat frustrated by the, the words and the regulations of the NCAA. And um, could could that be re-examined to look at disproportionate, for example, disproportionate uh, academic aid given to student athletes? I, I think it has to be, Walt. And you, from your decade-long service on the committee on academic performance, I mean, n nobody knows that world better than you do. And and um, when, I, when I look at those cases in general, let's set aside Carolina for a minute, um, it, it seems to me that we, we are at a place in higher ed, I don't think this is just uh, an athletic issue, where we do need to examine what are the right, yet again, we've done this frequently, <laughs> but yet again examine what do we, uh, rely on the the checks and balances within a university uh, to do. What do we rely on the checks and balances of regional accrediting or specialized accreditors to do? And what do we rely on an athletic association to do? Uh, one of the great problems in accrediting is that accrediting bodies basically only have two tools at their disposal. Probation, which seems to have modest impact, and a nuclear bomb. Deaccreditation, the, the, the dropping that nuclear bomb on an institution is to say we're going to close you down. This isn't like we're going to spank you or give you a scolding. We're going to put you out of business. Well, accreditors, which is to say, again, ourselves, because we are the accreditors in higher education, are very loath to do that. So, you know, the commission... Committee on Infractions rather came back and said, "So, Mark Emmert, go tell go tell Sachs in this case to you know buck up and do something tough." Okay, Sachs, put the University of North Carolina out of business. I mean, that's that's what their option is. So clearly, we need some kind of system that's gradated. Um, I, I I think that the similarly in the NCA rulebook now that's evolved over the decades, it's become pretty black and white. The definition of fraud is strictly up to the institution. Uh, I think as an, ac as an academic, I see that as perfectly appropriate. But I have no doubt that the commission did indeed feel, the, excuse me, the Committee on Infractions did indeed feel um, hamstrung. Uh, but they're hamstrung by, again, our own, you know, our own systems of saying, what, what do we, who do we want to hold ourselves accountable for what were at the end of the day academic failings, in my opinion. Mark, a couple of questions I want to ask about football, but before we get to football, I, I want to go to the higher order question you raised because I think it's an important one. First of all, I congratulate you for what I consider to be a candid and realistic assessment of our ability to self-govern in higher education, at least people's perception of that. And I think that's the threshold question ultimately for all of us is whether it's the future of the NCAA or just what's going to happen with higher education. Um, what do you think is the future of the NCAA? Given a couple of facts, one is, is as you've always said, it's a membership organization. 
um, and there are pros and cons to a membership organization. But as we increasingly see trouble spots, whether it's in football or basketball or any sport, it, can, it calls into question our ability to self-govern. And that means the effectiveness of the NCAA. So do you think the NCAA can continue on as it has? If not, what are the kinds of things that you think need to be changed about it? And I think what also complicates that is, is that one of the biggest issues we have in athletics is the FBS championship. And the fact that that is outside the NCAA, the revenues don't come to it. Um, and uh, that in of itself causes um, a lot of angst and problem in self-regulation and where athletics are going. So if you take the threshold question first is, what's your perception of where the NCAA AA is going over the next five, ten years. Is it a sustainable organization as it has existed? Uh, well, first of all, I think it's really important, Scott, to recognize that the NCA has constantly morphed and evolved over its century or so of, of existence. If you look at it in the beginning, uh, it, it took 50 years before it decided to have an enforcement arm because for 50 years it was operating under the guise of just saying, look, we trust all of you to follow the rules. Who would possibly cheat in college sports, right? Uh, see, that was a joke. I thought it might work, but clearly not. And, and, and the reality, of course, is that, that people have been misbehaving around college sports since the first college athletic contest. Uh, so there's nothing new there. And, and so it, it, it's changed, it's evolved, it's, it's moved along in, in various ways. And I have um, a, a high degree of confidence that it will continue to do that and, be, and remain a viable, uh, vibrant enterprise. In large part because you don't have a choice, Scott, when you stop and think about it. So let's just do the mental experiment and say, let's eliminate the NCAA. Well, okay, then what? Do we create a federal ministry of sport and let the federal government run it? They, they're doing a fine job of things. Uh, you know, do we create a new commission on college sport in America? Uh, well, well, who is that going to be? I assume it's going to be university presidents, right? Because as a, as a recovering university president, I'd sure want to control college sport in America. I wouldn't want to turn it over to another body unless I really wanted to really move a lot of things over there. And, and what will that body have to do? It'll have to organize championships. It'll have to certify people's eligibility to participate. It'll have to create a, an enforcement enterprise. It'll have to create a governance enterprise. Sounds an awful lot like the NCAA, only with a different name. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it really begs the question, uh, sort of the, the uh, Churchillian notion that, you know, we're in this self-regulatory model and it's the worst possible solution except for everything else. And, and I believe that's absolutely true. So if the university leaders who are the NCAA are incapable of reforming issues like this, why would they be any better in a different guise? Or the universities of America could all decide to turn it over, turn all of sport over to some other entity, in which case that would be fine, we would have European sport, which, you know, maybe that's what we want. Maybe we don't want to have sport associated with higher education, and we want to have an institute, a European, Asian model. But curiously, when I travel around the world, they all want to emulate our model, because they hate their model, and they all think that having education and athletics linked together is actually part of the secret sauce of success of America because of all the lessons our children learn in sport. So I, I'm actually pretty uh, optimistic in large part because it's the best possible solution. Now having said that, uh, we got to find a way to avoid having to, having to careen from crisis to crisis to generate the political will to deal with some of these issues. If you look at men's basketball, I would contend that 95% or something like that, 90 some percent of college basketball works really well, really, really well. But we do have a very small portion, 2%, 5% of people that really are, want to be professional basketball players. 
And they ought to be allowed to be professional basketball players. If you want to be a dancer, we don't make you go to, to Tulane to learn to become a dancer. We say, go be a dancer. There's a lot of institutes you can learn. If you want to be a tennis player, you can go to Bolotari and you become a tennis player. You don't have to come to Kent State to learn to be a tennis player. Go play tennis. But in basketball and football, we're forcing people into a system that may or may not want to be a part of it. And it's a small fraction, and it distorts everything. And we've got to deal with that effectively and be forthright about it. You know, when you flip over to the, to the uh, in, in the grand scheme of things, I guess, more a pedestrian question of FBS and football. And, you, you know, I think that, that uh, football has, since 1983, a Supreme Court decision in 83, when the NCAA was prohibited from, from uh, handling football broad TV broadcast. Um, you know, when, when we got to that point in time, football has become the economic divider among, among all of the schools. And we all recognize that. If you have a successful football program and you're in one of the five so-called autonomy conferences, your, your economics look very, very different than they do if you're not inside one of those groups. And, and everybody here gets that. Uh, I, I think that it would be unwise to assume that that creates some financial nirvana because a number of those 65 schools are finding ways to spend themselves into, into a corner as well uh, because competing at a high level in, in the autonomy five and football is a very expensive proposition today. And um, so, uh, you know, when I meet with your colleagues, your, your former colleague presidents around this issue, they're, they're uh, very anxious for revenue and they don't, they don't feel particularly wealthy with one or two exceptions, or five exceptions probably. Um, so, uh, you know, having a model that allows for big economic diversity that we have just in Division One alone, I think makes it very, very hard, Scott, to come to consensus. Uh, and, and that's what our changes to the governance structure were all about just a handful of years ago. Uh, it makes it much more difficult to to um, uh, get people to agree on important changes that are made. And so when you have in one division conferences with $5 million athletic budgets and $155 million athletic budgets, it's, it's, it's more cumbersome. So would a different dis distribution of football money make some of that easier? Yeah, I'm sure it would. But I'm also not very sanguine that's likely to happen. Just follow up for a minute, and, I'm, and this is on a personal level because obviously you care very deeply about student athletes and higher education. That's always been the case. D do you think going back to that 1980 decision about football, and then it morphing now into the C CFP um, and the revenue that they have and all that revenue going there, uh, even though the NCAA considers FBS be part of a membership, and a lot of it is controlled out. If you take that decision, you take th what that ultimately led to, uh, as you said, the autonomy conferences, or as others would say, the power five, and that autonomy now ha they have in the NCAA, do those developments in your mind, have they weakened the NCAA? Have they created uh, perceptions, if not reality, of conflicts of interest? Uh, you know, if we could do it all over again, w would we have something like that? Understanding we have it. Um, and no one's attributing, you know, uh, anything to anybody. But the question is, has that contributed to the culture and environment we have today? Because we have that divide. Divide's getting larger. It's not going to get smaller. Um, so what's your own personal view of it? Well, we don't get to go back and redo Supreme Court decisions. So, it, 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 you know, the, the, the whole um, uh, football's relationship with with the governance of college sport is, is the most complex of the relationships, right? It's, it's really why the NCAA began 115 years ago because of the, frankly, the carnage that was going on around, around football in America. Um, and it was indeed an effort to address the kinds of things we're talking about today. And those, those issues haven't changed fundamentally. They've morphed, but they're still trying to make clear that this is about making sure that this isn't about getting an education, making sure that it's about the health and well-being of student athletes, making sure that the system is fair for everybody involved. 
uh, and those definitions continue to, to change and develop. And I, and I think that's all gone very, very positively. So I, I, I think criticisms need to be in the context of that, that the, the development and immersion of different, different relationships is nothing new in this arena. Um, I think your assessment's right that the the economic divides will not narrow because the the only rapidly growing revenue source is confined to 65 schools basically. Uh, the the history of football having never had a championship, right? Because we it's it's all a historical anomaly, right? The bowls got started, we schools went to the bowls, a league conference championship was enough, and then you got to go to a bowl, and now we have a uh, proliferation, to say the least, of bowls, and and uh, you know we all were unhappy with not having a championship. We, the fans, and everyone. So of course the schools invented a championship, and as a football fan, I would say that's been that's been positive. Um, but the as long as my Washington Huskies get in every once in a while, I'm I'm, I'm happy. But uh, um, but I think it 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 has. Um, you know, because of that economic divide, it's created pluses and minuses. I, I'm a fan of, of what the autonomy decision-making process allowed. Uh, for those of you that, that weren't around, starting in 11, uh, my first summer, the group of presidents, I guess, Walt, you were there. <laughs> we're getting old, man. Uh, a group of university leaders came together, and we decided we needed to do a whole bunch of things to support students. We needed to eliminate the, the, the mandate that they only have single-year scholarships. We decided we wanted to change the availability of food for student athletes. We wanted to provide them with a miscellaneous expense allowance. We wanted to uh, increase academic requirements, a whole a, a wonderful agenda around helping students. And we couldn't pass it. Well, we passed it in the board. The board passed it twice. But it got overrode by the membership. The frustration out of that was driven largely by schools that said, you know, we can pay for it and we want to pay for it. And the Autonomy Five was born, in large part to do things that were very, very good for students. So do I think that was a positive outcome? Yeah, I think that was an extremely positive outcome. And schools that said they couldn't afford to do it now have found a way to do it. And, and any time we're spending money to compete for how well we're comp taking care of students and their educational needs, I, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, does it create this caste system? Yeah, it does. That's always been there. Uh, it just makes it, I think, clearer. And, and the demarcation line is more explicit. Uh, Alabama's always been Alabama. Michigan's always been Michigan. Uh, and, and there's nothing that we can do to change that historical fact. Uh, Mark, thank you, first of all, for uh, being here. Obviously, I want to add to my appreciation to everyone else's appreciation and um, gratitude for you coming before us. Um, at our last meeting, we met with uh, Dr. Franklin um, and highlighted the NCAA's diversity pledge. And it's you know great to hear that over 80% of, of schools uh, sign the pledge, but obviously pledges unto themselves don't move the needle. And we know that the, uh, the numbers with regard to diversity uh, can improve greatly. Um, you know, we have to go from pledge to execution. I, I imagine that's the, obviously the next step. Um, what do you think of the idea? Uh, universities are already required to, by federal law to report graduation rate data uh, for student athletes as well as file gender, rep gender equity reports. And that's accessible through the Department of Education. But what do you think of the idea that requires athletic departments to publish gender and racial diversity data um, for their departments, their administrators, coaches, athletes, and for access not only by the public, but by athletes who already are uh, attending the, the institution as well as recruits and their families. I mean, obviously, in my opinion, I think pressure needs to come from different areas in order to you know, kind of spur movement in, in this direction. And recruiting's the lifeblood of any program. And, you know, I think that, again, the pressure to execute has to be the goal. But if institutions are mandated uh, to compile that information and even articulate it in a way that uh, these families and others can understand, um, do you think that, one, that's a good idea? Secondly, 
Uh, if institutions don't do it, obviously somebody else is going to do it. Well, first of all, I think your, your base assumption is spot on, Lynn, and that is that um, pressure has to come from a variety of places. There's, there's a lot of folks that would like, uh, me included, to have an NCAA Rooney rule, but the NCAA as a collection of entities doesn't have any legal authority or capacity for doing that. Uh, a lot of states, labor laws would forbid it, et cetera, et cetera, so there's just no way to to, to do that as desirable as that might be. Um, the, the data on women and minorities in administrative positions, uh, including commissioners, with due deference to the one to your left, uh, is, is uh, inadequate to say the least. In, some way, in many ways, it's embarrassing. So I would be, I would be very supportive of the kind of um, provision of data and transparency you're talking about, uh, again, the NCA itself probably lacks the authority to do that because private universities don't release all their data, right? We run into the same issue when we talk about, about budgets. We'd all love to know all the budgetary data, and indeed we, put to, we the NCA national office, put together the best, best budget data. We also put together the best uh, diversity data. Uh, but we can get it from our, from our public school university colleagues, but we can't get it from our private schools. Not, I'm not knocking private schools. They just have different different uh, policies as, as independent nonprofits than the public schools do. So I, having spent my whole career in public universities, uh, I'm pretty used to all of that being right out there for everybody to see, and I think it has a positive impact. Uh, so it, it, if, there are way to, if there are ways to do that, I, I'm not one of those that loves to run to Congress for things around higher education, but that's probably the only way you'd be able to force everybody to reveal those data. But I think they'd have a positive impact for all the reasons you just said. Just, just as a follow-up, if you know they're competing for the same young athletes that come to their schools, if the public began that process, uh, don't you think the privates would have to follow? They'd be forced to follow. I, I would like to believe that to be true. Hi, Mark. I want to get back to basketball for just a few minutes. Um, you noted that the the Rice Commission, as we're calling it, uh, is going to get under many of the issues relating to the recruiting atmosphere and in particular the NCA's relationship with the N, uh, NBA. But I was just wondering if you could just talk about your own views on the eligibility rule, whether you think um, which direction should it go if what we have now, one and done, isn't quite right. Um, should it go back to none and done, meaning right out of high school uh, a player could be eligible to be drafted? Should it be something more than one? What might be realistic there? Because we all know this isn't the NCA's rule. It's, uh, it's a condition of bargaining in the NBA's relationship with its union. But if you could sort of preview that, and that's question one. Question two um, is do, do you think um, that part of the solution might be in some better structure for the pre-collegiate non-scholastic basketball world? Which, which, as we all know, doesn't have an oversight entity. High school basketball regulates through the states largely high school basketball. The NCA, however imperfect, as you noted, regulates collegiate basketball. The NBA regulates itself. And then, of course, USA Basketball has oversight over the national team program. But that pre-collegiate non-scholastic world right now doesn't really have a a structure, an organizational or regulatory structure, and I know that's been looked at uh, over the years. It's very difficult to sort of circle the wa wagons, I think, in that group, but I was just wondering now that this, you know, set of facts has been brought to bear, whether this is the time to try to double down on that effort, how it might be done, whether you think it could help. So a two-part question there. Uh, again, I know the uh, Rice Commission is going to be looking at all that, but if you had some thoughts on it that you could share with us, that would be helpful. Sure, happy to. Uh, first of all, I don't want to presuppose what the Rice Commission is going to come up with. That's, again, in, entirely up to them, and the directions they go are going to be their directions. Uh, so I, I, let me just repeat things that I've said in the past uh, and that I still believe is true today. A, as I mentioned in my opening comments, I, I don't think there's any compelling reason why somebody should be forced to go to college that doesn't want to go to college. 
I, I think that just makes no bloody sense. I mean, why would anyone do that? If somebody wants to become a professional athlete and develop the skills of being an athlete, then they shouldn't have to go to college to do that. Now, that presupposes that somebody else is going to provide those skills and that support, and for the most part, that's there in, in most all sports, but not entirely. Uh, so, you know, whether it's a, a one-and-done rule, whatever, the NBA rules and the, the contract between the Players Association and the NBA is their business and they're going to work on it. But do, do I think that the one-and-done rule distorts college basketball? Yes, absolutely, and I've said that any number of times. What I love, uh, something that looks like the baseball rule, right, where you go, can go on a high school, but if you come to college, you have to stay three years. Sure, I'd love that, but I think that's unlikely to occur uh, because it's not in the economic interests of either the Players Association or the, or the owners. So uh, since we don't have control over that, we have to look at the things we do have control over and, and the uh, leverage that we do have and uh, how we can change motivations and incentives that make sense. And so I, I um, have uh, great hope that the Rice Commission will spend a lot of time on, again, what does the transition, the development of a, of a professional athlete, what does that look like? Right now in, in basketball, this is an overgeneralized notion, I know, but in basketball, because of what's going on, to your second question, what's going on in youth sport, high school basketball is diminishing very rapidly in its importance. Indeed, the very most elite players don't play high school ball. So now we've got pre-collegiate, we've got an, an, a non-scholastic model that develops somebody from four or six or eight all the way through their career. Now they have to jump over here into a scholastic model for six months and then back over to their... Pro let, let's get rid of the six-month jump. I mean, just, you weren't interested in that when you were 14. What in the world makes us think you're interested in it at, at 18? Just, you know, create a professional pipeline. I think that makes imminently good sense. If you want to get, uh, play ball in a scholastic model at the high school level, we, ought to, we the NCA ought to be supporting that every way that we can. And, and I'm sure that there's tools and vehicles for doing that. Uh, we can in, influence the way some of the, the non-scholastic ball works by, by uh, restricting the things we have control over, our coaches. We can tell them what places they can go to recruit and what places they can't go to recruit. And that has a profound impact on, on uh, what camps are going to be held and, and, and what individuals are going to be doing over the course of their summer. So I'm very hopeful that the Rice Commission will look at all of that. But, but we do have, because of the youth sport industry in all sports now we've got these non-scholastic building blocks you know, there's a and and yeah they're they're getting an education but they're not going on in the context of traditional schools and in some sense that's emulating the european model of athletic development okay fine that just is completely different than what we do that's why i started by saying we've got to always go back to what's our core enterprise what's our business our business is educating and developing young people. It's not giving them basketball skills. That's ancillary to, <laughs> not at the core of. Um, and yes, we have young men and women who want to be professional athletes or Olympians at our campuses, and that's great. But they have to do that while they're gaining development as a human being and, um, and, and as, an as an educated citizen. That's, that's the challenge. Did I, did I answer your second question fully? Okay. Yeah. N maybe not satisfactorily, but fully. <laughs> but fully. Good morning, Mark. Just a quick question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the independence of the Rice Commission and how it's set up? Whether the it'll be be run by NCA employees or legal counsel? And then just one other topic that's been really hot lately uh, that Val brought up earlier is the transfer rule. And the transfer rule, and is and and how uh, you think about that as you as you move forward, um, either transfer while they're in school or the fifth year tra the graduate transfer rule. Yeah. So in, in terms of the Rice Commission, uh, we're making great going to great pains to make sure it has a high level of autonomy. Yes, Bud Peterson and I are ex officio non-voting members on the commission. 
uh, Bud because he's, he's chair of the Board of Governors and I because we'll be responsible for trying to implement whatever they come up with. Uh, the other members include only two individuals who are currently employed in, uh, in, NCAA, in the NCAA world. Uh, one is the athletic director from, from Ohio State, the other the athletic director from Hofstra. They're on the commission because they chair the two committees that have jurisdiction, if you will, uh, among higher education for men's basketball, the men's oversight, basketball oversight committee, and the men's basketball selection committee. So again, anything that comes out of the commission is going to have to be um, engaged in by those bodies, and so they're there as much as anything do to help sell whatever comes out of the the commission uh, to the broader world. The commission will is is hiring its own uh, outside legal counsel uh, and its own outside media. Uh, it has its own website. It has its own email address. It has its own everything. Uh, we will not have anything to do with their communications or their legal advice. Uh, my staff will be there to do the research or any other work that they that they ask, period. Um, so we're there, my, we being my staff is there as a resource, uh, that's all. We didn't think it was a, a necessary or a good use of resources to create a whole new staff structure for a six month long group that's gonna meet you know five or six times. And, and just, just thoughts on the transfer. Oh, oh transfer. Right? That's great. Yeah. Well, there's, there's yet another uh, working group on transfers. Uh, I think this is maybe the fourth, I don't know where we are, uh, which, which simply tells you that this is a very difficult question. Um, they are moving toward making proposals uh, as we speak. Um, I, I have said in the past, again, just my own views, and by the way, it's important to note, I don't get a vote <laughs> in this process, but uh, the, you know, the fact that uh, students can be directed to what schools they can transfer to or not transfer to, what schools they can get financial aid from or not financial aid from uh, by their, their home institution has never made sense to me. I think that's an, uh, I think that's an inappropriate level of control. Uh, I also think that a graduate student who has, who has done everything that you want him or her to do and managed to graduate on time or early has been successful and uh, I don't call those transfers, I call them graduate students. <laughs> Nowhere else in higher education do we call somebody that goes somewhere else for a graduate degree a transfer. We call them graduate students. Uh, you don't transfer from one school to another to get a master's degree, you go to that school to get a master's degree and, and they ought to be allowed to do so. Now having said that, I, I think that universities that recruit somebody uh, as a graduate student, for example, who, who know full well that this individual has no interest and getting a graduate degree and is simply transferring to play ball uh, and whatever their sport may be, that there needs to be some onus placed on that institution. Uh, I don't, there's a variety of options of what that could be, but uh, the, the, the burden shouldn't fall on the student, it should fall on the, the institutions themselves. Uh, so if we're gonna manage that relationship, it needs to be managed that way, not by um, controlling students so aggressively. We'll tie on time. Two final questions. Let's go Sarah and then Dave. We may have to close it that time. Uh, thank you again for, for being here. And I, it's very encouraging uh, going back to some of your remarks with respect to the fact that you feel that you're in the human development industry. Um, I think as I look at it as a former student athlete, I think since I've graduated, there's been tremendous gains made and you kind of cited some of those with respect to some of the Power Five universities and teams. However, I think for a lot of us, and I think even from the sort of court of public opinion, and again, you cited some statistics that show that we're kind of losing there, there's a lot of inconsistency with respect to how student athletes are treated, with, and, and then those all around them are treated. So as an example, as a student athlete, I cannot transfer to another school without sitting out, whereas a coach can transfer wherever they like. Um, on another hand, you have million dollar assistant coaches, um, and you have student athletes paying for the value of their scholarship. I will go on record and say that I absolutely think that that's a tremendous value um, and you graduate debt free and there's a lot of benefits that come from that. But again, the overarching narrative seems like there's a tremendous inequity. How do you think the NCAA can manage that moving forward? Um, as you cite, as going back to those statistics that you cited, how do you feel like you reverse those trends when I think these gaps, not only between institutions, but just that relationship between again, the student athlete and everybody around them seems to be going in a direction that honestly feels a little bit out of control, 
but moreover seems to really threaten the overall enterprise for the 95 or 98 percent of student athletes who really are having a transformative experience at their college campus. Yeah, I think you, you're asking the questions that I ask my folks almost on a daily basis because at the heart of this, I don't think we're in the human development business. We are. That's what universities do. Uh, it, they, they don't always do it as successfully as we'd like, and there are some people that, that are not being well taken care of in that enterprise uh, of, of the human development part of it. I, I, I'm pleased that we've seen over the past five or so years some really marked improvement in the relationships you're just describing. I, we were just talking about transfers. I agree with you. The transfer rules right now are, are, are inappropriate for... Uh, a, a lot of student athletes, and they they don't work to anybody's advantage other than other than coaches sometimes, and that's n not where the emphasis should be. And we need to be real clear about that and fix it. Uh, and we're, I think, I'd like to believe that the membership's on the verge of doing that. Uh, I believe that we need to do everything in our power to constantly be increasing the the resources, including time that's available to our student athletes to take full advantage of everything that's offered them in, in a great university or college so that they get as much benefit from that as humanly possible. I don't agree and don't believe, and I, you weren't asserting this, but I don't believe that student athletes should be employees of their universities or colleges. Uh, I think that um, is exactly how you eliminate college sport in America, and if that's the aspiration, that will be successful. <laughs> Um, but that's different than saying we can't provide them everything that we can that's, that's, as a judge recently wrote, tethered to their education. The move uh, this past year that's just going into effect around uh, increasing the time students have for themselves and for their academics I think is a very important step in the right direction, but it's a step. We need to do more. Uh, in that domain. We need to make sure that student athletes can take advantage of the preparation for life, whether it's time and resources for internships, time and resources for study abroad, time and resources to partake in part-time jobs, all the things that regular students um, get to take advantage of that athletes, because of their time demands, don't get to do that. Now, when I sit down with your former colleagues and, and ask them, uh, which I do on a regular basis at every campus across the board, divisions one, two, and three, I've done dozens of campuses, sit down with all the student athletes and we talk about all those trade-offs and I say, yeah, but is it still worth it? Would you do it again? They all say, in a heartbeat. So, so we're, I, I believe, and all of our surveys suggest that we're on the, certainly on the positive side of the ledger, but that doesn't mean we can't do more, and we need to. Again, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be able to serve on, on, on the Rice Commission. I look forward to working with Dr. Rice, a uh, very impressive person and uh, some great people on that board. So I'm looking forward to that activity. Um, I, that being said, I want to disagree with you just a little bit here, and I, I'd love to hear your comments on it. Um, you, 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 you make the argument that a lot of these kids that want to go straight into the pros shouldn't come to, to college, and, or, or why should they? Or why should they be forced to? And, and right now in this country, um, you know, we obviously have this um, racial tension and racial divide because um, you know, a, lot, a lot of people feel like the opportunities really aren't there for minorities and certain neighborhoods and certain, certain types of people. Uh, and, and I think there's a real disconnect here. Uh, I, as the Spurs, I mean, I know just recently we did a, a, a demonstration before the game, after the national anthem, uh, just to, to tell people to come together. And the reaction was visceral. Uh, a lot of season ticket holders threatened to get rid of their season tickets. And I mean, we did, <laughs> no one spoke. There was just a, a rolling of words across the screen saying we need to come together. We need to, we need to, um, we talked a little bit about equality, but we need to come together. And so there's a, there's a very strong racial divide here um, that's coming to the forefront. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic here. And I think that the NCAA has a great opportunity here to change this dialogue. Uh, these, there, should, there should not be this. Kids should be, we should be doing a better job of telling these kids 
or presenting to them the opportunity of coming to college as in the benefits for the long term that they will have. Your argument at the beginning was a great argument. 20, 30, 40 kids are gonna go to the NBA. The rest of y'all, we're your best bet, buddy. <laughs> you know, come on. You need to come here. You need to spend time on our campus. Even if it's one year, even if it's two years, you need to be here. You need to make the connections. You need to see a different world. You need to open up your horizons. And, and that's what these kids need to understand. That dialogue needs to change. There needs to be, instead of having a dysfunctional relationship where the kids see the NCA as the enemy who's going to pursue them if they take a little money here or if they do something wrong here, um, the NCA sh should be that organization that says, You're, we're your best lifelong friend. You come here and we will change your view of the world. We'll change your perspective and you will have a friend for life. Uh, and so, you know, for me, I think, both, both parties benefit from these kids coming to college, even if it's just for a year or two. If you have some of the best players in high school, why do we not want them at our university for a year or two? Why would we, it's, it's, this is obviously a tremendous business financially. It's a tremendous business for universities to gather alumni and, and bring communities together through their sport. Uh, it's been a tremendous thing, and, and I know you've made comments in the past about these bad actors, that it's, an, it's, it's all these bad practices and bad actors, but I would argue that there, are, <laughs> there aren't as many maybe bad actors as, I mean, it's just not, maybe it's just not being handled correctly. We love, why would we not want the shoe companies involved? They do a tremendous service to our universities. They want these kids, sure, but we can certainly encourage them to use proper channels to get to the kids and to the families they want to be exposed to, to them. But, but I, I think we, we can have certain control. I think we have this idea of amateurism for these kids and these families. And, and you're right, they go from a system in high school where they're getting free gear, they're getting whatever else, and then they come to college and then they feel like they're just totally cut off. And they still have a likeness, they still have value. You know, I would argue that Johnny Manziel, his greatest earning potential was while he was in college, he was Johnny Football. And we took away the opportunity for him to capitalize on Johnny Football. And, and so I, I think that there needs to be some more dialogue in, in that respect, um, in, in giving these kids some flexibility to their, sh we, all, we all acknowledge that this athletic career lifespan is a short window. And it's a great opportunity for these kids and these families. And I would argue that we should try to help them achieve what they need to achieve, whether it's in college or whether it's in the pros, and have the benefit of them on our campuses and, um, and, and experiencing a different world, a new world, and opening their horizons. Uh, I mean, I, I just think we should make a strong argument for them to be on campus. I, I just, I, I, that's where I differ a little bit with what you said, so I'd love to hear your comment on that. Well, first of all, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and the biggest, the biggest challenge um, that, that I worry about, frankly, uh, around all sports, but basketball and, and, and football are the most challenging because of the, the professional aspirations of, of players. I mean, every kid that's ever shot a free throw has believed they were going to the NBA, and, and, and we know when we survey our, our, our men's basketball players, we get data that is just shocking. 75% of those 5,200 Division I athletes, 75% say, I'm going to be a professional basketball player, right? 2% will. So the other 73%, you're right. The best bet is what's going to change their life is being serious about school, getting a degree, and going out and having a career, making a living like the rest of us, right? Uh, when we survey Division II, almost half of the Division II men's basketball players say they're going to make it. And stunningly, um, most of all, 24% of Division III players say, yeah, I'm going to be a Division I basketball player. Zero percent are going to be. But a quarter of them, nearly a quarter of them think they're going to be. And th 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 those, are, those are young men with some delusions that we don't want to go in and pop their bubbles, but we need them to understand that what's gonna be the game changer in their life is getting a college degree. That's what's gonna, gonna be the, the, the million or two million dollar uh, difference in their, in their earning potential in their lives.